Well, good morning, everyone. So good to see you all here this morning. Those who are present with us, those who are online, it's always good to be a part of what God is doing here at Life Center. Well, we are coming to our conclusion of our three-week series that we've purposed to call Good News, Great Joy. And we have, uh, over the last several weeks, been focusing in on the Christmas story, specifically understanding it's uh, understanding it through the eyes of some individuals. The first individuals were the shepherds who felt left out. And we all could in one way or another know what it's like to feel left out at times. And then last week we looked at uh, Mary and Joseph, those who feel overwhelmed. And we are deep in the season where it's easy to feel overwhelmed. And today we're going to deal with Anna and Simeon, those who were waiting Waiting. It's interesting that uh, waiting is always part of our life in one way or another. And, and throughout the Christmas story, waiting was a part of that story as well. Understanding it. And understanding God's timing in the midst of what he unfolds is key for us to grab hold of his truth and understand that he has a plan for us. It says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, you see, just at the right time, we were still powerless, Christ died. Just at the right time, God knew the perfect time, the right time to bring Jesus, uh, to bring us hope, to bring us help. It was all in God's timing. Some moments in our life and some moments that God uses are, are um, suddenly moments, I like to call. Uh, there's times that God will move in our life just all of a sudden. You'll meet someone, someone will say something to you. It's just you're not expecting it, those suddenly moments. Luke chapter 2 talks about one of those. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Those, those uh, shepherds were in that moment. They were just doing their thing and yet suddenly in the midst of their life they experience an encounter with the heavenly, an encounter with God. Yet there are other times that God moves in our life and God does things and it takes a little longer, more than a suddenly, more than just a moment. And it's in the life of Simeon and Anna that we see that lived out in Luke chapter two. And we're gonna get there to share that in just a moment. But let's just ask God to help us today to understand his timing. Lord, we just invite you to be a part of our conversation today. And I pray, Lord God, that you'll lead and guide us today to understand your word and let it bring truth and let it bring freedom and let it bring help to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Luke chapter 2 and verse 25, and it says this, There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation. And the Holy Spirit was in him, was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under law. Simeon took him in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace, as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation." You have prepared it in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Simeon, a man who was old, along in age, but was given a promise that someday you're going to see the Messiah. Now understand that for Simeon it was an interesting thing because not only had he been waiting, but the people of Israel had been waiting for the Messiah to come. And being told someday before you die, you're going to see him. And maybe he woke up every day saying, is this going to be the day? Is this going to be the day? But suddenly on this day, after years of praying, he finally meets Jesus. And then we go to verse 36. And there was also a prophetess, Anna, daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple, serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. 84 years at least. Simeon was apparently old. Anna was at least 84 and beyond. And they're waiting for this incredible promise that God was going to bring 
this Messiah, waiting a long time. We hate waiting. We don't like waiting. It's very evident, even in this Christmas season, you can tell that the, the patience is wearing and people don't like to wait. And we especially don't like to wait for our food. We don't like to wait for that. Some of you remember back in the day when you used to cook on a fire. Maybe some of you, that's your history. You used to cook on a fire and it would flame out and we knew what it was like to cook on a fire. And then all of a sudden we got the oven and all of a sudden the oven, it became easier for us to cook because if we had the oven, things would be easier. But then that wasn't fast enough. And so then we came up with a microwave. The microwave, that, that's going to solve, that will cut off some time for us. But that still wasn't good enough. And so then we came out with the Instapot. <laughs> and the Instapot, well, that's going to be the answer. And, you know, you can cook some ribs in 25 minutes. And, you know, that's, that's the answer. And, but yet it's not crisp enough. And so then we came out with the air fryer. <laughs> the air fryer. You're sitting here going, yeah, got that one, got that one. Don't use that one, got that one. Because we wanted somehow to become faster and get in our food. What's going to be next? Are we going to eat food raw? Yeah, I guess we could. That's even faster. But we don't like to wait. We don't like to wait for things. And yet what's interesting in this spiritual journey, part of what God does within us is this expression of waiting. See, you cannot judge God by your calendar. God may appear to be slow, but he never forgets his promises, he may seem to be working very slowly or even being forgetful of his promises, but when his promises come true, and they will come true, they always burst the bank of our imagination because God's grace virtually never operates on our time frame, on the schedule we consider reasonable. We find ourselves in those moments where we need God to show up in our life, to show up with answers and with directions and miracles and those moments where we just need to feel Emmanuel, God with us. That God, you're with us in that moment. All through the Bible, we see those moments where people were waiting. Daniel was one of those people in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 12. Don't be afraid, Daniel. And the angel was speaking to him after he prayed out to God a prayer looking for answers. From the first day that you purposed to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your prayers were heard. Here's the thing we have to realize about our prayers. The moment you pray, God hears the prayer. The moment you speak out to God, in that moment he hears that prayer. And sometimes we wonder, does God hear my prayers? Careful, because he hears every prayer. Every prayer. The moment you prayed it, God heard your prayers, and I have come because of your prayers. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, come, came to help uh, me after I, I was left there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to help you understand what will happen to your, you and your people in the last days. For the vision refers to those days. 21 days, Daniel waited. Actually, 21 days, Daniel waited and he prayed, he fasted. And then God brought the answers to him. 21 days. He was asking, God, will I ever have the answers? And God brought it in 21 days. Anna and Simeon uh, prayed a long time and the answer finally came, waiting for their answer, waiting for Emmanuel, for God to show up. What about you? What have you been praying for? What have you been praying about? What have you been asking God for? What have you been asking God to do to you or through you or with you? What miracle have you been asking God? What direction are you needing from God and you're here today and you're in the midst of that? Have you been waiting? Some of you learn the timeline of God, which is simply, he's never early, he's never late, he's always right on time. Over the years, you've learned that lesson, you've prayed through miracles, you've come to that point, but even over time, maybe you've forgotten. It's easy to forget those lessons. It's easy to forget that there's a thing called timing. When uh, my oldest son was little, uh, he uh, had uh, went to a store one time and he saw this shiny rock. So he kind of got it into his head that he was going to start collecting rocks. So he started collecting rocks and he came to me one day and said, hey dad, I'd like to get my rock shiny, like I see in the stores. Can we, can we shine my rock? And so Christmas was right around the corner. So for Christmas, I got him a rock tumbler and uh, 
So he was so excited. And so after he opened it, we went out to the garage and we laid it all out. And we took his pile of rocks and we put it in there. And then I put the first envelope, the first abrasive, and I stuck it in there, put some water and sealed it. And then I put it on the tumbler. And as, as it was sitting on the tumbler, I began to read the instructions, what was going to take place. So as it's on the tumbler, I said, okay, put the first abrasive in, yep, the liquid in, yep, and let it tumble for seven days. <laughs> My son kind of sat there, he looked at me and thought, huh, maybe he, and so I kept reading. After seven days, put the second abrasive packet in and let that turn for seven more days. And every time I'm saying seven days, I could see my son processing in his little mind. And you could see the joy that as soon as we got out there, it kind of turned to wonderment. And then by the time I got finished, done finished reading all the instructions, it was going to take 21 days. 21 days. And when he heard 21 days, he said, forget it. <laughs> and he walked back into the house. And I sat there in the garage sitting in front of this rock tumbler with two different thoughts. One is, what a waste of money. He's not even happy. And secondly was, well, I guess I got a rock tumbler. Because I can't wait to see what these are going to turn out. But 21 days, he heard that and he said, forget it. But isn't it interesting that we oftentimes act like my son? We say, God, Lord, could you make a way? And then we find out seven days and another seven days and 21 days and one month or one year. We just say, forget it. God, you're just not going to do it. Remember, God hears every prayer. He hears every prayer. And so we wait and things don't happen. And so we feel like giving up. We give up on our marriages. We give up on our relationships. We give up on our jobs. We give up on our health. We give up on all these things, the dreams that God's put on our heart because it didn't happen when we thought it should happen. It didn't happen in the right timing. All of a sudden, we come to that place and we just feel like giving up. You're so much like my son in those moments. We have a dream. We have a vision. We have a need. It's going to take that long, then forget it. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. Yet often we forget it took years to make the mess that we're in. And it's going to take some time for God to get some stuff out to make it work. We want God to make it happen now. Yet Galatians 6 says this, don't become weary in doing good. For the proper time you'll reap a harvest if you don't give up. Isaiah 40, but those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. But God, I don't want to wait. I don't want to, I don't want to keep going if that's what it's going to take. I just want to give up. Why does God use the wait in our life? You see, it's in the wait that God is doing something in you that can't be done outside of the wait. It's in the wait. For you see, every miracle that God does in your life has spiritual significance. Every miracle. Everything that God is doing in your life to bring answers, to bring direction, to make miracles happen, every one of those miracles has spiritual significance to you. God doesn't waste miracles. He doesn't just wake up one day feeling good. I'll just give miracles out today. I'll just pass them out like Santa Claus. No. God never wastes a miracle. And every time God is doing something in your life, bringing miracles, bringing direction, bringing answers, he's doing something in you. He's perfecting something inside of you. Because God doesn't waste miracles. He wants to help us grow. In James chapter 1, we see his roadmap in this process. James chapter 1 and verse 2, and it says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Some observations I want to make about this passage of scripture. Number one is this. 
Trials will come. It's not a matter of if, but when. We're going to have trials. The Bible says in this world, you will have trouble. Trials will come. Some of you here today, you just got out of a trial and you're feeling pretty good today. Some of you, you are on your way into a trial. Some of you, you're in the middle of your trial. You're in the middle of your testing. You're in the middle of your pain. You are in it. Trials are going to come in our life. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And you may sit here today and say, well, I'm doing really good today. I have no trials. Well, wait for it. It's supposed to snow this weekend. <laughs> trials are going to come in your life. So they will happen. Number two is this. Trials are a test. Therefore, they have a time period. Every trial has a beginning and has an end. And when you're in the midst of a trial, you've got to understand that. There's a beginning and there's an end to the trial. And so when you go into it, you know, okay, I'm going to get through. There is an end to this thing. With God, I know it's going to be okay. There is an end to this thing. Or you're in the middle of it and you're wondering, when is it going to end? It will end. There is a time period that you walk through in the midst of trials. There is a time period. And can I say to you that your obedience is the key to help you process through that trial? The quicker you obey, the quicker you walk into compliance to God's word, his will, and his way, the quicker you're going to get out of that. See, because every trial, remember, God is working stuff to, to, to spiritually bring significance into your life. And he's developing something in you. I'm reminded of Jacob as he wrestled with the angel. And as he was wrestling, the angel said, hey, let me go. And, and Jacob said, No. Let me go. No, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And so what did the angel do? He wouldn't obey, so he, he hit him in the hip. Hit him in the hip, and for the rest of Jacob's life, he walked with a limp. And this limp was just this ongoing, I should have obeyed. I should have obeyed. Obedience will always help you in the midst of that trial. Thirdly, we're to be joyful during them. Because you know. Now, if I just say, be joyful in the midst of your pain, be joyful, in the, you know, it, it almost, even as you read it, it kind of sounds like it's not realistic. I mean, how, how am I supposed to be joyful in the midst of trials and tribute? How am I supposed to be happy when I'm having an awful day? But then there's these three words that somehow change the whole meaning for us, and it's this. Because you know. You can be happy, you can be joyful because you know. Because you have this knowledge of something. And when you understand what that something is, it's incredible how it enforces this joy that he wants us to have. Because you know, and number four is this, trials develop perseverance. Trials develop. Now there's, three kind of, there's four kind of trials, and there's probably many more, but I want to focus on four kind of trials that we face in our life. There's some trials that we face in our life because we did something dumb. I mean, there's no question. You're in the midst of that trial because you did something dumb. You made a decision. You know you shouldn't have made that decision. You know you shouldn't have said it. You know you shouldn't have done it. And you are in the midst of the trial, and that's why. Sometimes we're in trials because the devil's just trying to get a hold of you. He's just trying to attack you. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy and he's doing that. And he's making it happen in your life. And he's just attacking you. And you, you, under, you understand it's a spiritual war that you're in. Sometimes we're in a trial because God's perfecting us. He, he's just kind of rubbing some of those rough edges off. He's got you in his tumbler. And he's tumbling you around because there's some stuff that needs to get worn down. There's some sharp edges. There's some things that he's just trying to refine in you. And sometimes you're in a trial and you don't know why. I mean, I've checked myself and I, I don't think I've done anything dumb today. I, uh, I don't think it's spiritual. I don't think the devil or God or, and you just don't know why. And maybe you're in one of those situations today. I don't know why I'm in this trial. I don't know why I'm in this pain. I don't know why 
this is happening in my family or in my body or in my, in my job. I don't know why. But in every one of those situations, you want to hold close to God. Every one of those situations, you want to get close to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm not quite sure why I'm in this, but you've got something that you're trying to work out in me. So I'm just going to hold on tight because it develops perseverance in your life, this stick to for you, that you'll stick with it. You see, it's in the midst of those trials that God is trying to perfect something in you, if anything, perseverance, that when the going gets tough, you're not going to go. To some of you, your grandparents, your kids and your grandkids need that you're going to stick with your faith. Parents, your kids need to see that you're going to stick with your faith. Kids, your friends need to see that you're going to stick with your faith. No matter what happens, come hell or high water, I'm going to stick with my faith. Because God's doing something in me. He's perfecting me. He's, he's doing something in me that I can develop perseverance. For what end? Number five, trials help us to become mature and complete. Mature and complete. That God actually has an idea about what he's going to turn you into. He's going to make you shiny to make you mature and complete. Maturity is that thing that begins to establish within you that remember every miracle has spiritual significance that God is the beginning to develop different muscles in your faith and, and, and different, different completeness in your spiritual faith because he's trying to perfect you because here's the thing that we have to understand about God working within us. Oftentimes when we're in the midst of our trial right here today, we oftentimes think this is just about so I can get through the rest of the day. But what God is trying to do in making us mature and complete isn't necessarily about today as much as it's about next week or next month or next year. And as you find yourself in this place and you're wondering in the midst of this new trial you're in and you realize you've got the muscle and the faith to deal with it, it's be, you can sit there and go, oh, that's what that trial was about. God was doing something with me here so I could be strong here. And guess what? God's doing something with you here so you can be strong here. And I wish I could tell you it ends just about there. But no, 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 it starts all over again. He's, he's with you here so he can be here. And it's because he's perfecting you, making you mature and complete so, so you can be strong in the midst of the trials, so you can grow in faith. And all of a sudden you come to this place of maturity that all of a sudden trials hit you and you're like, <laughs> oh, I remember when God was with me in that trial and I remember when God was with me in that trial and he got me through it. So now you got this big trial in front of you and you're like, okay, I'm not sure what. Oh God, this is, this is a big one, Lord. <laughs> I'm not mad, I'm, I'm joyful because man, you're gonna make me strong in this one. I can count it all joy because I know that you're doing something in me. Every trial, every tribulation that I'm in, I can be joyful going, I'm not quite sure, whew, how am I to get through this one? But God, wow, I didn't know I needed help in that area, but all right, let it go, God. Go ahead and mature me, complete me. Interesting with Anna and, and, and Simeon, for years they waited. For years they waited for the Messiah. For years they were waiting for that moment. And it says this about their waiting. They never wasted the wait. But they prayed and they fasted and they worshiped in the process. God, I'm not sure what you're doing, but Lord, I'm, I'm waiting on you. I'm gonna worship you. I'm going to worship you because I know what's coming. I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast because I know what's coming. Next year, January 10th, we're going to kick off 21 days of prayer and fasting. I want to encourage you as, look, as we look forward to that, as we get to that point, to begin to help developing those spiritual muscles of prayer and fasting. But they, they, they were in this moment of prayer and fasting and waiting on God and walking in maturity. 
Because God wants to mature you in every area of your life. So you begin to understand that it's people on your enemy. And even though they come and rub against you and they get, you know, no, they're not your problem. All of a sudden, you can in maturity not get so easily offended. Maturity, you can begin to walk in that. It's a story of this woman who, uh, World War II time, she, uh, her husband was out at war. She had a big house and trying to figure out how to make ends meet. And so she decided to begin to rent some rooms out in her house. And um, the church she was going to, uh, some of the other people began to hear about this. And some of her other Christian sisters began to tell her, I can't, I can't believe you're, you've got men, single men staying in your house while your husband's not there. That doesn't look good. And a lot of criticism came her way. And as she's sharing the story with this person, the person said, when you went through all that stuff, did it make you bitter against the church? Did it make you bitter against God to have people criticize you when you're just trying to make ends meet and survive? Your husband's at war. Did it make you angry with God with a lack of support? <laughs> and she said, as only she could in her older age, oh, silly. I never confuse God with people. God's God. People are people. Don't ever confuse the two. Don't get mad at God for what people did. That's them. That's maturity. You come to that point that you're not getting all upset and angry because of what people do. Hurting people hurt people. You gotta get a hold of that. When they bring hurt to you, wow, God, what's their pain? I'm not gonna let them hurt me. You're walking in maturity. You've learned how to develop that muscle and God is working to mature and can make you complete, make you mature and complete in your prayers, in your forgiveness, in your relationships, help you be mature and complete in generosity and tithing and giving and forgiving and all those things, those spiritual muscles he's trying to develop within you. And remember, obedience is the key to get through it. As you get through it, all of a sudden, you get through that situation and now you're in the next situation and you're like, okay, I can handle this and I'm not getting all bent out of shape because, yeah, if you think this is bad, I remember when God did that and he helped me get through that and he's going to help me get through this today. And finally, trials help us lack nothing. To lack nothing. God's wanting to make you mature and complete, perfect and shiny, so you lack nothing. God has you in mind when he begins to look at this. And he sees all the pieces that he wants to straighten, to shine, to buff out making you mature and complete so you're lacking nothing. So you can live this faith with strength. You can live this faith with this ability to share it with others. This ability to share it with others. And, and, and you know, it was funny. I was talking to an older gentleman either with first service or Thursday night service, and they said, nah, you know, that was a good message for me. And he goes, I know I'm older, but I still got a few rough edges. And I've known Jesus a long time, but he's still getting some rough edges off of me to make you mature and complete so you're lacking nothing. So when the trials and tribulations come, you're ready. You're able to, without hesitancy, count it all joy, knowing that I'm not gonna waste my weight. I'm not gonna waste it, God. I'm gonna keep solid. I'm gonna stick to it. Generations will see me because of my wait, waiting because of what you've done in my life. God never wastes a miracle. And you see, God's more interested in developing your character than he is your comfort. Although character will bring you comfort and bring others comfort around you. God's more interested in developing your holiness than he is your happiness. Although happiness comes from holiness. God is developing us, maturing us, making us complete. Do you have a need for a miracle today in your life? Are you in this segment right now where you're in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the circumstance, the uncertainty, the pain, and you need God to show up in your life? Do you need 
uh, because you know moment to just kind of hit you today, remembering that God's got a plan here, that you're not in chaos. God's working in the midst of it. What do you need today? Maybe today you just need to invite Jesus to be part of your pain today. Maybe you need to say yes to Jesus and invite him to be part of your life and welcome him into it and begin to have purpose in life. Or maybe even today you do need God to enter into your trial with just some assurance and some encouragement to know that he's still in control and he's working it all out. Don't waste the wait. Whatever it is, God wants to help you today. Would you bow your heads with me as we close? Father, I'm so thankful that you don't waste miracles on us, that you actually have a plan. And I pray for the greatest miracle that could take place in our life, and that is for a person to come into faith with you and invite you into their life. And as your heads are bowed, and as you're in this moment of prayer, maybe even online, you're in this moment of prayer, and you feel like, I need to invite Christ into my life. I need to say yes to Jesus today. I need his help. And if that's you, with just this simple prayer, Jesus, I invite you into my life today. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And as much as I know how, I make you Lord of my life today. Lord, I pray that you'll visit each of one of those people today with your peace and your help and your love. And I pray, Lord God, for those today who are in the midst of their trial, the midst of their waiting, I pray, God, that you will rush into that moment with your incredible peace. And Lord, with the incredible peace that because we know that you're at work making us mature and complete so we lack nothing, God, reassure your people of that today. And Lord, help us to cooperate. Help us to walk in obedience to that which you've called us to do, that which you've called us to be. And let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard their hearts and their minds now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, today, if, uh, I'd like to encourage you to take your, your app out. Uh, you can uh, scan the QR code. If you're online, you can click the link there. We'd like to help you on your next steps. And perhaps today you said yes to Jesus. Click that and we're gonna get some information to you, help you on that journey. Or perhaps even today you're wanting to not waste your weight and you're just, hey, I just want to ask for that prayer. I don't want to waste my weight. I'm going to keep solid what God's called me to do. Just click that. Or, or perhaps even as we're coming up to this Christmas week, you need to invite someone to church this week, to our, one of our Christmas Eve services. Bring some hope in somebody's life this week with your invitation. Would you stand with me today? I want to pray for you today as you go. Father, we pray now for your people as they go from this place that your blessing will be upon them. That as we come into this week, Lord God, I pray that your grace will be with them. And you, Lord God, will continue to mature us, making us complete in every way to fulfill your purposes in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. As you go out today, please grab a meal to someone who's in need or if you're in need, remember, we don't just go to church. We are the church. Let's be the church this week. Lord bless you.